Hello, and welcome everyone to this week's conversation with, with the iAdvise team. Happy Election Day. Uh, first and foremost, my fellow Americans, get out there and exercise your right to vote. And maybe you can put this on in your, uh, your fancy new AirPods while you're waiting in line to do so. Uh, if you're anything like me, you may have considered duct taping a pillow over your ears to escape from politics during this campaign season. So we at iAdvise did our part to give you an excellent distraction. The Nate Brown is here to speak to you about lighting the CX fire. And if you're anything like me, years back, before I actually even met Nate, I knew him as the man wearing a cowboy hat. So we'll, uh, we'll see if obviously that's the case today as well. Uh, a little bit about Nate, in case you actually aren't aware. He's the chief experience officer at Officium Labs. And that company's vision is to help build brands, excuse me, help brands build the best in class customer experiences that their customers are looking for. And also, Nate is the co-founder of CX Accelerator. It's a community and resource hub for customer experience professionals. And as you can kind of gather, Nate is the go-to for CX, innovation, and creating world-class experience. Um, I saw somewhere, and in, in, in I'll call my study of Nate, uh, that he's been coined a perpetual student of the world's greatest experiences and the people that create them. And uh, secretly, I've been a little nervous, to be honest with everyone. Uh, Nate and I made a joke about dressing as Uncle Sam today, and uh, I am very relieved uh, recently to see that he's in normal clothing. He has threatened to change back to an Uncle Sam outfit. Uh, but Nate, can you hear me? Are you there with us? Hello. What's going on, Mr. Fox? And man, I wish I had my Uncle Sam yeah. outfit on. Gosh darn. It, it, <laughs> it woke me up in the middle of the night last night, uh, I was super worried. I was like, ah, we made this joke. I wonder if he took it seriously. And I know you to be the man of uh, some real high class style. So I was concerned you already had an Uncle Sam outfit in your closet. The fact that I woke somebody up in a, in a stupor of sleep, uh, wondering about what I was wearing, makes me very happy this morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. Huh. Uh, Nate, let me get in your head a little bit. Tell sure. me about something you've been reading lately, uh, something you've learned, a book you've enjoyed. Uh, where is your brain these days? Hmm. Yeah, got a got a couple over here. I've been just just reading so many great folks. This this tribal leadership right now is is just awesome. The Matt Dixon article on reinventing customer service on HBR. If you haven't seen that, it, it is just so brilliant how modern the the thought process is. And it's basically organizing this incredibly large customer service enterprise into tribes, into yeah. like families of 50. And they're very strategically organized to deliver this exceptional and personalized customer care to different geographic customer segments. So, I, I mean, it got me reading this book because I was like, the, the power of this tribe, this number of, of 40 or 50, there, there's some magical thing here. And, yeah. and there's just a lot of psychology there. I mean, when you get to lock in, with your people and, and serve together, there, right. there's an incredible thing that happens there. So I highly recommend that book. Right. And that, that feeling of camaraderie, right? That's important oh, yeah. for your own team. When you can know everybody's name and, right. and know something about them, you, you are able to serve well with, with that group. As soon as you get too big to where you can really know everybody's name, know something about them, develop some, at least, uh, at least a peripheral relationship with them. Right. You've lost a dynamic that is very important to keep in your customer care environment. Mm. Um, and uh, apologies, I did give Nate the heads up. I've got a daughter home sick, so you'll hear some screaming in the background. I promise we're not torturing her. <laughs> uh, I hope she feels better. Yeah, it makes it seem that way. Um, now, Nate, uh, I, give me uh, from your pre-COVID even, because I don't want to stick to COVID, uh, tell me about a memorable customer experience you've had and maybe a reason why your loyalty to a, a brand is undying uh, or maybe for a bad reason hmm. why you've been turned away from a brand. Yeah, I'll, I'll use, I've got, got one in front of me here. B&H Photography as an example. I got this condenser mic from them and I'm very loyal to, to B&H Photography. As a photographer, I get, get all my, my nicer, more expensive gear from them. And it was actually a very simple thing that tipped the scale in their favor I, I was on their website and I was having some difficulty finding the item that I wanted. Live chat session comes up. Hey, yep. can we can we help? I asked a question. Phenomenal, frictionless live chat experience. Got what I wanted. They follow back up. And, and this person is like, hey, is, is there anything that we could do that might improve this web experience? 
Yeah. As they noticed, you know, it took me a little bit of time to find the item I was looking for. I gave them just some simple feedback around this. I had a fine experience. It wasn't right. bad. And you know, we talk about peak end and how we only deal with the super pissed off customer or the super happy customer. Well, I was in the middle and they so aggressively closed the feedback loop with me and made a change to the website mm. based on the feedback that I get, which, which gave me great pride. It's like, I've helped, I've helped B&H photography. Right. And so now, I mean, the, the first place I'm going to go, if I'm going to shop there, I'm like, Hey, I, I, I have, I have made an impact on this brand. They have earned my loyalty forever. Right. And I think also they're listening. Yeah, exactly. Care to listen uh, to just one of their customers is the way you were seeing. I, I think that's super important and probably something that we're not experiencing enough as consumers. Yeah, I mean, aggressively close the loop. I mean, right. only only seek voice of customer data to the point where you can do something meaningful with it. Right. If, if you've opened the floodgate too wide, you're actually exposing yourself to a to a situation where you're not going to be able to honor that customer's feedback well enough. Mm. Uh, major Burger King place. Oh, dang. Okay. Burger King. <laughs> had a miserable experience the other day going through their drive through Took 25 minutes. Yeah. Uh, did the whole receipt survey thing and went through the whole process, gave significant feedback on a couple things that could have been different. That was, that was two weeks ago. Not a single word. Mm. So it's like, you know, we just, we need to do a better job respecting the customer's voice in these situations. All right. And closing the loop. Yeah. Um, so, and I'll make this easy for you because this is a, a yeah. question that might take a little bit more thought. So I'll give you an extra five seconds by talking about myself first. Um, I've said a few times in these live stream sessions, McKinsey put out a report, 75% of consumers are changing the way they buy, changing the brands they buy from mm. during COVID, right? Just because convenience, trust are, are super important these days. And I know we're going to talk about that again shortly. Um, my... My question for you is, of course, how have your own buying behaviors changed? Um, and if I reflect on myself, I've noticed personally that I'll do less kind of one-off transactions and rather go for quality and one exceptionally good purchase, high mm -hmm. AOV compared to numerous smaller ones. Um, but with everyone on their couch and sweatpants these days, Nate, have you seen yourself change as a consumer during COVID? Wow, what a, what a cool question. I, I, love, I love this idea of like mission-driven buying decisions. Right. And us changing our buying behaviors because of the type of people that we are and that we want to become. Right. And, and in, in my case, there, there actually has been a, a one shift that I've made. I, I used to be addicted to fast furniture, which I didn't even know what that term was until I, I got to know Janal uh, and Katie. So Katie is uh, a, a chief experience something something at Showfields. Mm -hmm. and, and Janal is like an operations manager at Feather. And so it's one of these organizations that come in. And if you're like renting an apartment for a year, as an example, instead of going out to Walmart or whatever and getting a bunch of fast furniture that you know you're going to throw away in a mm -hmm. year, they furnish that for you with some nice stuff. Then at the end of the term, they come and grab it and somebody else can use it. It's a much more sustainable option. Right. And so for me, like I, I aggressively pursued some antique furniture that had been sitting under my cousin's house for years. Mm. And I, I happen to love that, but like this, it pushed me in that direction of I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do what's required to get that instead of me going out and buying something that's going to end up in a landfill. Right. Yeah. And I, th I think uh, we made a joke about this before for anyone in the Boston area, our, our North America headquarters is in Boston. There's this thing called Alston Christmas, a little neighborhood <laughs> inside Boston where because we're such a college environment, college town, there's uh, a time of year where all the students, they leave for the year. <laughs> and that means that some nice items I've gone by uh, for runs throughout Boston and see some beautiful TVs just tossed in the curb. But oh. It was just taken out of the, the show window and dropped in the garbage. Uh, so I, I love the initiative. The effort in there is uh, that's big time improvement. Funny you say that. I actually got these winter Crocs on the side of the road <laughs> on a jog. Uh, coming, coming down my road, somebody had thrown these by their trash can. I'm like, you know, I can't pass up a good winter Crocs, so and now they're on my feet. And in, in my limited exchanges with you, Nate, if those winter Crocs aren't the epitome of your personality as I know you, I, I don't know what is a better representation. Those Thanks. cowboy hat together might just be your full outfit, right? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so, Nate, talk to me a little bit about lighting the CX fire. What does that mean to you? Yeah. Well, it, this is hard work that we're doing, Terrence, in this area of CX. And yeah. sadly, the reality is the burnout rate is very high in customer service and CX work. 
Mm-hmm. And, and the rate of success in terms of our ability to make a meaningful difference back to the organization, HBR, Bob Thompson, there, there's uh, quite a few analysts out there through Forrester. Uh, the, the, the actual success rate can be very low for us. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's time to, to get some energy and excitement back into this work and to change the playbook up a little bit so that we can have better results. We can demonstrate better our ROI with this work and that we can all enjoy it. Well, we're well, we're getting there. Well, we're well, we're fighting this good fight together to serve our customers better. Mm. If I, I had a tweet recently and said, "If you're not excited about CX work, you're doing it wrong." Right. And and I really do believe that because it's it's like a calling. It's like a privilege what we're getting to do to take the stress and friction out of people's lives to enhance the relationships that people have with the organizations that that define a part of their identity. And right. this is incredible work that we get to do. So I'm I'm all about bringing the fire back into this. Let, let's be excited about the impact that we're having and, and both enjoy the journey more as CX professionals and also enhance our ability to have ROI back to the organization. And I think that's so fascinating to me because I talk all the time about brand saliency. What mm. drives someone, what creates that energy in them to, word. to engage with a particular brand, right? And actually they have to have the product you're interested in in the first place. There has to be that fit but uh, the emotion that makes uh, someone like Patagonia come to my mind when I'm looking to get some outdoor equipment, yeah. what is actually that, what is that that causes that? And of course, in this CX space, you have the impact through lighting the fire to, to build up some of that emotion, no? Mm. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, when you say Patagonia, I, I think REI, like I just- yeah. And it's different for everyone. It's supposed to be, right? Well, but, uh, and, and we have different personalities. I mean, we're drawn to different brands and it actually does show a part of us, the right. type of organizations that we are excited to do business with. And when we become that type of organization that can that can generate that excitement and that fierce loyalty and draw our customers to us mm. <laughs> through really authentic customer experiences, it's awesome to see that happen. Right. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... It's it's an area that while many uh, brands are focused on, you know, trying to scale up the customer experience and maybe giving an experience that isn't optimal, but just making sure that there's some sort of experience in place. Uh, I, I like the the thought of doing some things very well compared to doing most things poorly, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's important. Uh, and you talk to me a little bit, a little bit about Efficium Labs. What's going on there, Chief Experience Officer? What is your day like at Efficium Labs, and what are you guys doing? Yeah, we're doing some great stuff in the CX space. So we're we're all about creating and delivering incredible customer experiences, and and it's a lab. So we get to be creative in all these different ways that we get to do that. But there are two primary ones, and one is Talent Place where we, we have burst capacity, we have staff augmentation, connecting the best CX talent to the best brands. So we, we can do that coming into the holiday season. People are thinking of, about burst capacity. We can make that happen very quickly and easily. And then the other uh, other side is experience matters. And, and that's what that's what I got brought in to, to really help to, to lead and to create some, some great service offerings inside of experience matters. And so we have our transformational consulting. We have the, the capability to come in and audit and, and set up your strategic roadmap for CX success and uh, a variety of trainings and workshops that we can do, a, a CX pep rally that we could give uh, to light that CX fire. So uh, there, there's some great things that we can do through Officium Labs. And it's been a true pleasure working here uh, in, in 2020. I mean, everybody's like, what a crappy year. I'm over here. Yeah. Right. This has been kind of a cool year for me. And I feel guilty saying it. Yeah. You know, uh, there's even for myself, I'm wearing a suit jacket, but I have Lululemon shorts on. I'm having a good time. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so there's some good to it. Um, Nate, I had a conversation last week with Lucille DeHart, of, uh, formerly of Bed Bath & Beyond, awesome. and she talked to me about uh, buy online, pick up in store, buy online, pick up at curbside, and mm. uh, the opportunity for brands to you know, make that a customer experience, right? To uh, have some outdoor type showrooms during the holiday season and to, to attack an opportunity that really isn't being fulfilled at this point. Mm. Do you, and I'm putting you on the spot, so I'm you know, take your time if you need. Okay with that. Do you, yeah. Do you see <laughs> for any forward thinking other opportunities for brands to capitalize as we adapt to this always on consumer? Uh, what do you, I guess, what are you looking for, for some brands to do today? Yeah, I think, I think there's a few levers that we can pull here that, that are changing. I mean, right. it used to be all about 
how can how can I get the cheapest thing that, that's going to meet the immediate need that I have? Right. Now we're moving towards more of this mission driven experiential economy. <laughs> so I mean, the, uh, using the example of show fields, they're they're creating these really innovative shopping spaces where mm -hmm. they're rotating brands through it so that one geographic demographic can get exposed to all these different, really engaging, really sustainable brands. Right. And it's not just sitting there for years and years becoming stale and stagnant. They're, they're, they're rotating it through. They're getting that energy and excitement up around, here's this new inventory that's here, this new brand that we get to showcase for you. And, and they're even going to the extreme of like doing really innovative art and like yeah. creating this whole experience inside of the shopping environment that goes around a certain theme. I mean, you, you come in there and you're, you're excited to be a part of what's going on. It feels different than walking into, you know, what, what used to be a, a traditional retail environment. So, I mean, th that idea of mission led purchasing decisions is one huge lever. How can we tap into the, the type of person that people want to become and the type of thing that gets them excited? How can we tap into that? That's one. Another huge one that's becoming so clear and obvious this year, especially is the idea of, of like trust and convenience. <laughs> You have to make it so easy for people and, and bring the friction out of it. It can be fun and it can be exciting, but if you're putting up hurdles and, and making it a frustrating experience, I mean, my, my poor wife out there literally this morning testing for COVID mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just in this huge line, there's no clarity, no communication around yeah. how she's going to be processed. Um, you know, it's, it's just, there's so many frictionful experiences that are out there. And we, we've got to get that friction out. I mean, some of these legacy industries around our real estate, the healthcare space, I mean, it's just ripe. It's ripe for us to take friction out and, and put the focus back on trust and convenience for our patients and for our customers. Right. Yeah. I, um, I think a lot about, so uh, our client base in the U.S. for with I advise, you know, Samsung, Lowe's, some big names, Nespresso. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of what their customers have been engaging the brand about, especially the ones with brick and mortar, is, is it safe to come into the store? Yes. Um, you know, when should I come in to be safe? You know, be safest, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, so trusting convenience is it's right on the nose, right? They need to feel comfortable being with you, right? They need to trust that you will put their best uh, uh, concerns, their concerns first. Yeah. Uh, but also it's interesting to see on the trust side, uh, you've seen major brands like Lowe's US, Marvin Ellison did a ton for the Black Lives Matter movement. Yep. Uh, and they're also drumming up that this is the business I want to be engaging with. Yep. Then we look at convenience and we have someone, I think it's like Sam's Club. I always say Sam's Club or Costco. I always mix them up, but I'm almost positive it's Sam's Club. They Good. released a concierge service for wow. online pickup at Curb where they'll come mm -hmm. to you with a tablet. I've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing some... Some brands are adapting faster than ever and doing yes. some things to, to improve their relationship and make it easy. Uh, but yeah, trust and convenience now more than ever at a time when I said, uh, McKinsey says 75% of consumers are kind of throwing loyalty out the window. So important. Yeah. I, I had a fun one. I, I'm sitting Creekside with a, with a trout lure. I, was and I, realized I, I heard that, right? Yeah. I didn't have my fishing license. I had forgot to purchase it that year. Uh, and you know how much of a pain in the butt that can be to go through that yeah. process. I jumped on to the TWRA social media, tweeted them, and they immediately sent me their self-service portal. I was sitting there waiting to, to fish. Didn't have to leave my my, my chair mm. and was able to, to order my fishing license through the, the help of that self-service portal and, and the hookup on their social media account on a Saturday morning. All right. And I mean, that, that's a space where you, you took a just a pain in the butt experience. Right. And, and you made it so quick and easy for people. And, and there's so many opportunities out there to do that. And it's it's fun too, Nate. And I'm hoping that, of course, you did all this while a park ranger was walking towards you and you were, <laughs> no. you were able to do it on the fly. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's funny too for the dinosaurs in this space, in the CX space, that when you are able to make an improvement like that, it stuns people. Like, yeah. like you in this scenario where you're like, wow, I can't believe they've made this and adapted so quickly. And it... Now you're telling me, I'm going to tell other people that you've seen things like that happen so quickly. And that sort of experience when you are able to pivot so quickly, big yeah. time, big impact. No, it's raising the bar. And that's why people are saying you're not just competing with your immediate competitors. 
You are competing with Amazon. You are competing with these great brands that are escalating customer expectations. Yeah. And, and there are some bad things associated with that. We have some very entitled customers in the world. <laughs> That's right. just a reality. But overall, I think it's great. I, th I think we deserve to have great experiences. And I think brands could do better if, if they weren't historically maybe a little lazy in this area mm. and focus so much on their product and service. They're driving around with the dome light on in their car. It's all about us, what we do, the money we can make. It's time to turn those headlights on and look at the world around us and see how we can serve our customers better and serve our people better in the process. I'm intentionally trying to not talk over you when you give these great sound bites, Nate. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, so last question for you, a little more forward thinking. Um, of course, we don't quite know the outcome and we're headed into a tough time of year for both uh, consumers and COVID and, and everything else going on. Um, is there, give us some light at the end of the tunnel, Nate, what do you think is going to change? I mean, of course we're, we're being told that this digital acceleration is, is here to stay. Mm. Um, what can you say about that? What do you think will be uh, like, what will life be like in six months down the road? And apologies for these poorly articulated questions. I'm thinking no. as I talk to you, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And I think that people will have more working flexibility than they've ever had, which I think is a beautiful and wonderful thing. I mean, I, I think back to my life just a couple of years ago, I was dead in my office chair. I was dead in it. And yeah. I had to sit there in that thing for nine hours a day. And, and I had a, I had a great organization. I was serving. I had great people around me, but just yep. the, the physical reality of me having to fight through a 40 minute commute, go sit in that office by myself and, and sit there until the magic time arrived psychologically that that is not conducive for most people to do their best and highest quality work. Now we've morphed into this zone where work and life. Yeah. It's a little more fluid and there's some things, there's some boundaries that need to be created there. That's important. But at the same time, we can enjoy a better lifestyle where we're more present for our families. We can take better care of ourselves. We can be better leaders for our people. Because I feel like right. it used to be a butts and seats management situation yeah. where the leader was just, all right, got to make sure everybody's here. Got to make sure they stay here and that their breaks aren't too long and this and that. That that was like our legacy concept of leadership is that right. people at least give the illusion of doing their jobs. We've shattered that. Now you have to actually guide your people towards meaningful outcomes. Real work. <laughs> right. Right. And it's I would say Creativity is thriving now. Yes. Leaders, I, I, I'm shocked. And Gene Bliss said this. Karen Hurt said this. We, we are shocked to see the evolution of leadership and how much people are reaching above and beyond where what they could do last year. Right. To be better leaders for their people, to take care of their people in new ways. Simon Sinek talks about you don't win with the sharpness of your sword. You win with the strength of your shield. And people are creating these great circles of trust around their teams and, and doing it better and more effectively than what I've ever seen before. Because mm -hmm. the old way of thinking, the lazy way of management has been eliminated and, and we've had to evolve and it has happened. So I, I think, I mean, we want to have a little bit of hope thinking about 2021. I'm excited to have more time with my family, more engaging work and, and be able to just be present, be present at work and be present at home more. That, that's what I'm excited for next year. And I hope that most people are going to have that experience next year. Yeah. And small anecdote for you, Nate, because you talked about your commute. I've actually never had a job where I wasn't able, wasn't able to bike to it. Oh, wow. And now that I, my wife and I, we moved outside of Boston. Uh, I'm far enough away, but with the pandemic, I don't have to come in and can't come in. Uh, so I'm not being tested on my ability to bike 45 hour and a half, whatever it is to, to Boston every day. That would be tough. Yeah, the challenge survives. <laughs> uh, well, Nate, uh, if there's anything else you want to share, please feel free to go do so. Uh, Fritz, before we give Nate a break, because I know he's got a puppy crawling at his door looking <laughs> to go out. Uh, are there any questions for anyone today, Fritz? Cool. Nate, you're off the hook. It okay, was great. Well, awesome. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I'm thrilled with you guys at Officium Labs. I, it's obvious you're doing some pretty exciting things, and I wish you all the best. Yeah.
Thank you so much. And same to you. I, I think it's awesome the brand you're creating and just rooting for, for you guys very much. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you, Nate. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Next week, we have Kristen Narrigan, the VP of Strategy at Akinio, uh, who will be joining us to talk about how CX is dead. And she's going to talk about product experience. So CX is dead. Long live product experience is the topic for next Tuesday. Uh, I want to, again, thank Nate Brown. This man is busy. He's running around uh, between conferences uh, and just obviously speaking sessions. Nate is a, a super valuable source of information as it pertains to the customer experience. And uh, we thank him for taking the time to talk about lighting the CX fire. Uh, but thank you all for tuning in. Like, share, subscribe, and tune in next Tuesday at a, a 12 Eastern. Excuse me. I said 11 before. Uh, to join us with Kristen Narrigan of Akinio. Thank you all.